Good morning and welcome back to, back to Aberdeen Baptist Church during our time of uh, social distancing. Uh, this is a message being recorded for Sunday, April 26th. Uh, we're going to head back to our study on David and wrap up some thoughts on Absalom. I mean, uh, there was a heavy one last week. If you followed that one along as we dealt with, um, you know, the, some of the factors that paralyzed David, well, we're going to deal with sort of one more, but this is the after the fact. This is after the, the death. This is the broken father, David, now that he's just so overtaken with remorse, but there's also regret in there, and it's holding him back from being the person he needs to be. And I mean, it's a, it's a difficult time for, for David. I mean, he's staring at, a, uh, at the tragic death of a loved one, and that's the only thing he can see. He's focused so narrowly. All he can see is Absalom, his son, is dead. There's, there's no going back, and it was, I'm sure he's feeling it was an, it was an avoidable, an unnecessary, a tragic death, something that should not have happened. And so for those of us who are, are not there yet, but may have a relationship that's in disrepair or in dysfunction or something, you know, a wayward child or mm -hmm. something of that nature, there's, there's, you can still do something about it. And so there's still time to act. Um, you don't want it to get this far. And so we need to talk about that before we open up really the story. I mean, I just, you need to, do, we need to do something. We know that, but sometimes the something we do is not right. And part of the reason for that is you need to earn a voice. We need to earn a voice in order to give input into the life of even a child. But, and maybe you've heard it said, you need to listen to me because I'm your father. Uh, a child does not hear that. That's, no, I will listen to you if you've earned that voice by showing me, first of all, that you love me, you have my best interest at heart, you are compassionate, you're caring, you're supportive, and you're willing to tell me the truth. But you need to do all these things first. You can't just come in here and throw the truth at me in such a way that uh, I don't believe that you really care for me or that you really have my best at heart. So, I mean, we have to earn that by, first of all, caring. And then as you earn that, and I'll give you a story I read once. Uh, a pastor was talking about a situation where he was really down. I mean, he had a wayward son who had gotten into addiction. I mean, what a pastor feels terrible about that, especially in the wake of uh, descriptions of a pastor needs to be able to rule his own family well. And so he, it was weighing heavy on him. He didn't know what to do. It was breaking his heart. Um, he was empty, and so he's faking it Sunday morning. He's trying to minister to others from a reservoir that's empty uh, in his own spiritual life. He's just, he's, he's a beaten man. And he said after the service, he came up, a parishioner came up, someone who he knew, but he didn't know well, who kind of wasn't, a, wouldn't be considered a friend, but this person just kind of bluntly gave him the advice that he needed in their mind. He says, you need to stop being so harsh on your son. Well, the man didn't have any fight left in him. He knew he was he was not doing it right. He, he felt like he had pushed his son to somehow to addiction. And so he kind of mumbled out, kind of trying not to dissolve and just in front of him, you know, uh, he said, well, brother, keep praying for me. And the man said, I'm not praying for you. You have to learn the harsh truth. And... I guess that leads us to the comment, if you're not praying for someone, then don't give them advice. You don't care enough about that. They're, you're not on their side. You're not looking for the best for them. And so you can't instruct them. We can't instruct them. You have to start by caring enough. And that person needs to know you care before you have that voice, so to speak. But anyway, let's, let's move to David and Absalom. I mean, this is where David is. Things have now gone too far. He can't now go back and tell Absalom, I'm sorry, uh, I should have acted in the, in the Amnon case before. I should have accepted you back into the family. We should have, you should have been eating at my table for these last couple of years instead of being banished. That's, I, I've done so many things wrong. Okay, 
but it's there's no there's no reconciliation now for David and Absalom. I mean, it's not it's not possible. David's wayward son is is dead. So he's overcome by grief. So we want to read. I want to read just one verse first of all, and then I'm going to read a little bit more. We're going to read that verse that kind of describes David's state of being uh, upon learning about Absalom. And this is at the end of chapter 18 of 2 Samuel, it says, verse 33, And the king was much moved, and went up to the chamber over the gate, and wept. And as he went, thus he said, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would God I had died for thee. O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. And he's just overcome with grief, but there's that sense of remorse or regret involved in there. I wish it had turned out differently, uh, that I would take your place, I would be the one to die. But Joab, he comes in and like it or not, like him or not, Joab is right here. Joab sees the danger David is in, that the kingdom has been fractured. Uh, everybody's kind of wondering, okay, Absalom's dead, half the king, more than half the kingdom, supported Absalom. Absalom's dead. David has not really reasserted himself. He's not come in. His people aren't championing. They want to cheer. cheer. They, want to re they want to return. They want him to be retake the throne, but he's not really doing that. He's just sitting there. He's paralyzed. He's just focused. He can see nothing but the loss of Absalom. That's, he's got his blinders on to all these other things. And so the whole nation's saying, what happens now? To those who supported Absalom, it's like, well, what's going to happen if David returns? How is he going to view us? Uh, uh, do we need to support somebody else? I mean, there's a vacuum here. And even David's own people are, they're wanting to celebrate. They've had a wonderful victory and they're looking at him and he's not celebrating. He's not saying good on you. He's not awarding medals for valor. He's not saying thank yous to those. And so they're like, well, what do we do? He's not really being the king. Uh, right now, Israel, it's not just that David is paralyzed. Right now, the nation is paralyzed. And Joab sees this, and he comes in, and he pulls no punches. And hey, hey he's a brother, um, or he's an uncle, in essence. He's, uh, he's David's uncle by, by blood. But he comes in, and he just lays it on the line. And he said, David had said, I wish that I had died in your place. And Joab says, in fact, you wish we'd all died. And Absalom, you'd be happier if all those who supported you, all those who risked their lives, uh, all of them died. And, and your enemy, the one who wanted to take your throne, to destroy you, that he lived. So I'll read for you a little bit more from uh, 2 Samuel chapter 19. And this is Joab's confrontation of David. In verse 5. And Joab came to the, into the house of the king and said, Thou hast shamed this day the faces of all thy servants, which this day have saved your life, and the lives of thy sons and of thy daughters and the lives of thy wives and the lives of thy concubines, in that thou lovest thine enemies and hatest thy friends. For thou hast declared this day that thou regardest neither princes nor servants. For this day I perceived that if Absalom had, li Absalom had lived and we and all we had died this day, then it had pleased thee well. Now therefore, arise, go forth, and speak comfortably, or that is, speak speak um, to the heart of your servants. For I swear to the Lord, I swear by the Lord, if thou go not forth, there will not tarry one with thee this night, and that will be worse unto thee than all the evil that befell thee from thy youth until now. And the king arose and sat in the gate. And they told unto the, all the people, saying, Behold, the king doth sit in the gate. And all the people came before the king. For Israel had fled every man to his tent. They, they all didn't know what was going on until the king now makes a public appearance. And so Joab, he tells them the, the, the truth and calls David out. David, you're, you're sitting there focused on the blinders of just Absalom. And the, I mean, David has to come to grips with, you know, Joab. I'm acting as if Joab's right, and it's wrong. I don't want all my friends to perish. I don't want those who supported me to have died instead of Absalom. But our grief, our remorse, our regret takes us to a place 
where we're not thinking clearly. And we, and Job needs says, no, you need to think clearly. You need, you can't do anything. You can't live with regret that paralyzes you in the past and that kills your future. And right now, Israel's future is in jeopardy and you're killing it because you're sitting stuck in the past with something you can't change. Now, I think I want to say, I feel like there's three areas of regret or remorse that David's struggling with. And the first one, it seems to be, and maybe it's framed a little differently, but seems to be remorse that for Absalom's eternal situation. I mean, this is a man who's not in the frame we would say saved. Um, take a look at the difference or consider the difference between, remember when uh, David and Bathsheba conceived of a child and Nathan called them out on it. Well, God called them out on it, used Nathan the prophet to call him out on a sin of adultery and murder of, of uh, Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, and said, the child that is born to you will die. And the child was very young and the child took sick then. And David was praying. He was uh, fasting. He was mourning. He was, he, was, he was praying consistently. He was overcome prayer while the child was sick, asking what the Lord would please uh, relent and give the child this, this child life. I mean, David's feeling this, this is my sin. The child's paying for it. And then the child died. And everybody thought, oh, this is going to put David over the top. He's already been praying and fasting for this child. And now when it's dead, he's going to just tank. And it was the opposite. You know, they were surprised that he didn't go down this dark hole of despair. Instead, he said, no, well, you know, while he was alive, I could pray for him and the Lord might change his mind. But now that he's dead. I can't do anything. Uh, I. He can't come to me, but one day I will go to him. So David had a sense of this child's at least eternity was held in God's hands. Now that's a separate separate discussion for a theological point of the the, uh, the the eternal place of children. Uh, I believe that they are saved because uh, uh, they have not yet had that opportunity to know to reject evil and cling to good and uh, cling to Christ. So uh, that's there's a problem that argument of the age of innocence. But anyway, um, he seems comfortable that, no, my son's eternal future is set. Because David's a man of God. David's a man of faith. David's a man who's placed his life in the hands of the master and wanted his son, and knows his son is in the hands of the master. But with Absalom, I'm sure part of that regret is it's not so, because it's Absalom that when he hear of the death, he doesn't get up and say, well, you know, one day I'll go to Absalom and he can't come to me, but he's, no, it's like Absalom's eternity has now been set and it's set in the wrong direction. He was a rebel. He he rebelled against me, but he also rebelled against God, the king, the, the Lord's anointed. Um, his life was not one that showed that he trusted in God. His There was no fruit of a life of faith there. And so that's the first area of regret. The second area of regret would be, they're all related, but the second area of regret was that Absalom's life was a life of disaster, wrong choices, a rebellion. Uh, that he was, he got darker and darker as things went on. He brooded until he decided to usurp his dad's kingdom, at, out, really out of spite that his father was not reconciling with him. And the third area of regret, and possibly the biggest, was that David felt responsible for all, for the first two things. It's my fault that he didn't have a godly heritage, and it's my fault that he's not walking with the Lord. It's my fault that I didn't deal with Amnon and that rape situation with his sister or half-sister, and it's my fault that I didn't reconcile with Absalom after he took the action I should have taken. It's, it's my fault all along the way. I created Absalom. And so, I mean, these are huge questions that plague us today, and we do need to say some things on these. I mean, we put these blinders on of remorse, and we can't actually see the truth. David couldn't see the truth. Joab had to hit him over the head with it. You, you're, you don't really believe this, but you're acting as if we could all die, Absalom lives, and you'd be happier. And no, your life would be terrible, and your enemy would be still after you, and those who love you would not be there. Uh, so anyway, um, as you think on on this this area of remorse, 
uh, we need to say these things. Think about our own life. Yes, every one of us, our parents' failures seem to get replicated in our lives. So whether your parent uh, you know, was a worry wart, you become a worry wart. With your parent was a control freak, you become a control freak. Or you have some of that tendency within you. If your parent had anger issues, you tend to be fly off the handle. Uh, you know, if, whatever it is. But all of these uh, things that we pass on, that we wish we wouldn't pass on to our children, we do pass on to our children. But we can't, uh, every person is responsible for themselves. We can't be healed if we cast it upon our parents. Well, I'm an angry person because my dad was angry. Or I am in addiction because my dad was an addict. Or I am this because my, my mom was this way. That's excuses to continue on a disastrous life. Uh, we, are, we all know we're sinners. We're born with a sin nature. Our parents pass on their kind of sin nature to us, too, uh, by their behaviors. And we pick it up because that's how we're bent to pick it up. And so I say this saying that the only way forward is not the way to excuse. I, I really do not like our current um, psychological emphasis on, oh, your child has anger issues. Uh, they, they've been diagnosed with an anger disorder as if they're not responsible when they get angry. Yeah, they may, may not have an angry father or they may, not, they may have an absent father and so they're angry. Yes, they're angry. But we cannot just excuse it and say, well, that's a clinical diagnosis. They, they can't help it. We'll, we'll never get better. What's a recipe for continuing? If you say, hey, addiction is an illness, not a choice. And we might have inherited some of this, but it's still a sinful choice we are responsible for. So the only way forward is to bring it to Christ and say, these are the things in my life that are destroying what I want to be. These are the things that are keeping me in rebellion against God. I lay these at the cross. I have to see them first. I have to own them then. That this is me. That's not just my dad or my mom or my grandpa. Or, it's This is me. This is my weakness. This, this is my kryptonite. And I lay it at the cross, Lord. You cover it with your uh, righteousness. You, Your blood pay this price. And now help me to yield to the Holy Spirit to move forward in newness of life. It's the only way. So what I'm saying there is you can't, uh, in our own lives, we, we can't be just saying, well, I'm this way because my mom was this way or my dad was this way. That's just a, a, a remedy to stay stuck in a destructive pattern. That is not a way to move forward and grow in our life and in our ministry and in our walk with God. So it's also... If you're the parent, you can't get stuck in that. And, oh, my kid's life is a disaster because I, I created it. Yeah, you may have had a role in it. We all do. We all pass on our sins to the, but it's Christ who intersects it. They are ultimately, just as you are ultimately responsible for your own choices, they are ultimately responsible for their own choices. Not everyone, child will grow up. You might have one black sheep, so to speak, in the family and three that are doing quite well. Um, one that has rejected faith and three that have embraced it. And you say, well, what did I do wrong? Well, I was showed favoritism. Yeah, you may have had a contribution, but ultimately we are responsible for our own choices and not everybody will react the same way. And I mean, if you had four Absaloms, one of them may have revolted and the other uh, one may have come and asked dad, what's wrong? Why won't you talk to me? You know, and oh, hey, and he may have opened the door for reconciliation, even though dad may have been too proud to do it himself. Um, so we don't know. We, it's not set. It's not all their moral failures. You can't carry them. We need to let go of re remorse or regret because re remorse or regret keeps us stuck in the past. And it's, it's stuck in a dead past and it kills the future. There is no going forward. David was woken up to this that, hey, you're stuck in remorse. And not only are you stuck in a a place you don't want to be, a dead place where you're just dwelling on bad thoughts and what ifs and how comes and I did wrongs. You're also killing your future. And in, because you're the king, you're killing Israel's future. They don't know what tomorrow holds. They don't know who their king is and they don't know how he'll react. Get out there and show them 
where the what the way of the future is. And if you read the rest of uh, Second Samuel 19, it doesn't come jumping out at you, but it's there. And it's clear when you kind of put it in your mind what's going on here. The rest of uh, Second Samuel 19 is, is David becoming the king and giving a future for Israel. But because he's gone through this real difficult time, and this is what difficult times do for us, he is a wiser king for it. He, and you see it in the rest of this chapter as, I mean, first of all, there's the, there's the healing of the, the people that supported uh, Absalom, and then the people who supported David, and how are we going to come together? And David comes together and brings first, first the, the, king, the people of Judah. Hey, are you going to rise up and recognize me as king? Yes, they are. Okay, now we're going to do the other side. The other side is, oh, oh, you know, are we now going to pay the price for having supported a rebel king? And he says, no, you, he, he brings Israel back in. In fact, he brings Amasa, who was the captain of Absalom's army, and he brings him in. And, I mean, David is now a healer. He's not. He could say, you were, you know, an instrument of rebellion, and your sentence is death. And he says, uh, no, uh, I, I recognize that this is all a tragedy, an internal tragedy. It's Israel against Israel. It's brother against brother, and it's time for healing. And so he says, no, you... Will uh, you will be a captain in my army under Joab, uh, and so of course later on Joab will kill Amasa, but that's Joab. But right now David's placing the healing; he's bringing the two sides together. Uh, he goes on to bring the two sides together. Another who a person who was a thorn in his side during the rebellion was this guy Shimei, who hurled accusations and threw rocks at him just kind of as he was running with his tail between his legs from Jerusalem after uh, Absalom had risen up in power and David was on the run with just a small band and Shimei throws taunts on him. Now Shimei is a relative of King Saul, so he's still bitter that Saul is not on the throne or Saul's lineage is not on the throne and David is. And so he was throwing insults and everything. You're a bloody man. He was probably uh, accusing David of the death of... Uh, of um, some of the other ones, uh, Abner and some of the other ones who Joab killed. Uh, but anyway, uh, he comes and he's pleading for forgiveness, sort of. When you, If you read it, when Shimei comes before the king, he's not like, I really have had a change of heart. And all those things about I said against you, I realize, boy, I was in error. He's basically saying, don't kill me for what I said. But he, it doesn't read like someone who is truly coming in repentance. It reads like somebody who's a bit of a, in a crass way, we might say a bootlicker or something. He, When you're in power, he's your man. Uh, when you're not in power, he's going to, his true colors are coming out and he's going to stomp on you and he's going to burn you in effigy. Uh, now it's the reverse order because first David loses power and that's where Shimei's power is, his colors, true colors come out. Then David regains power and now Shimei's changed his tune and say, no, 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 please forgive me, don't. And so he's not really uh, repentant. And David doesn't really forgive him. But David heals the situation by saying, go, what have I, what have I to do with you? What have I, I, my family got to do with your family? He recognizes he had a part in bringing this whole thing to pass. And if I'm going to heal, I don't need to start causing more division. So he just, he basically says, you have, I have nothing to do with you. And I mean, that's, there's some wisdom in that. Now that's, this is a political maneuver. Uh, and eventually later on with Solomon, he said, you do need to deal with this guy because he has a point of which uh, uncensored rebellion still festers in him. But anyway, uh, he's saying, I, you're not a part of my life. You don't, you don't matter. And so there's, this is also true. We sometimes we're looking for people who are our antagonists who are against us to approve us. And somehow we need their approval. Well, David's saying, I know I don't have your approval, even though you're asking for forgiveness, you still don't like me. You still resent my leadership. And so I'm saying, just go live your life. I'm gonna live my life and we don't need to meet. I don't need you in my life because you're gonna be a source of difficulty for me, not a source of strength. You're not one of the friends I wanna build around. You're a guy who I don't need to build around because you're really a quiet enemy, uh, just biding his time. And so I'll just leave you alone and you leave me alone. There's wisdom in that in our own relationships. 
Uh, but then he goes on after after Amasa, and then Shimei, then comes forth uh, Meshibatheth. Me, oh, excuse me, Mephibosheth. Uh, that is a tough tough name to to say. But anyway, he is he is the son of Jonathan, David's dear friend, who was lame as a child. He was dropped on his on on his leg, and so he can't walk. So he would be like a wheelchair type person, and what we would see a, a paraplegic uh, loss of legs. And anyway, he. Um, he was apparently, in David's eyes, he abandoned David during this time of the revolt and took sides with Absalom, or that's what was reported to him because uh, Mephibosheth's servant was supposed to strap some mules and bring some provision and take Mephibosheth and himself over to David when David was running for his life and say, here, here's some supplies, and here we are with you. Our lot is cast with you because, I mean, David took Mephibosheth after Saul, uh, Jonathan and, and Saul's death and said, you will eat at my table forever. I want to be faithful to you and loyal to you because your dad and I had a special relationship and I want that to continue with you. And so he's been very gracious to Mephibosheth, who could have been seen as a contender for the throne. But obviously Mephibosheth is with David. And Meph Mephibosheth wanted to be with David on the run, but his servant kind of uh, used this time so his servant saddled the, the, the animals and took the provision and went to David without Mephibosheth and said, oh no, he's celebrating that finally that David is done and Yahoo, maybe I'll get the kingdom back and he's, he's plotting his own revenge. That was all lies. His servant was just uh, taking advantage of the situation. But David now is dealing with both sides. There's, there's the one side, the, the servant who lied about Mephibosheth and Mephibosheth who actually, from the time that David left Jerusalem. He did not shave uh, and uh, and he did not wash. So he was in a situation of mourning and it was evident. So he says, no, I, I was not rejoicing. I wanted to be with you. My servant beguiled me or deceived you. Um, and I've been, I've been in mourning since the day you left. And David sees that and says, ah, now there's a true loyal friend. At first he thought, ah, oh, this, this guy, I thought we had something, but he's betrayed me. And he realizes, no, he has not betrayed me. This is somebody I want to build my life around. When you see somebody who not just sits back and says, well, it's unfortunate that David's gone and I do miss him, but actually he mourned with him for the entirety of the time he was gone. It's like, that is a man I want to build my life around. And so he is restored. But the servant who also kind of supported David, but kind of threw his master, on, well, did throw his master under the bus or under the cart, so to speak, and ran over him. Uh, David heals here too. He says, I had already given the servant all of your inheritance. Now I'm saying split it. And I'm, I, it's all coming from me anyway, but split it. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure. And Mephibosheth says, as long as I can, I'd be with you. I'm fine. I don't care what, what lands I have. And uh, there's a healing there. David has become in the process of this because he knows that he's not, it's not just right and wrong. It's yeah, I created a lot of this mess. I'm going to try and heal it. And so he heals both sides. And then finally, the last one in, in the chapter is Barzillai, who is an old, old man who is, and he says, I can't even taste food anymore. But he provided provision for David and his, and his fighters. He was loyal. And uh, David says, how can I reward someone who's this loyal? He says, you don't need to reward me. I can't really taste food. Uh, life, I mean... I can barely read. It's, you know, so he's 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 old, and David says, "No, no, no, no. Your your family is going to be provided for. Uh, they're going to know how valuable loyal people like you are to me. These are the kind of people I want to build my life around. Invest. So he's investing in some of them. The others, he said, "No, you're you're not really with me, and it, it's not like I hate you. It's like I just I'm going to build my life around those." who are with me as Joab kind of accused him, says, you'd rather these people died. And David's like, oh, you're right. I don't want, I want to build my life around these people. I want to move forward with Mephibosheth, with Barzillai, with their families. You know, I, I want to move forward with those who supported me. I want to even move forward with Amasa, even though he was on the enemy's side, but his heart must, may not have necessarily been totally there. I want to move forward with those who can build a better Jerusalem, build a better life. And that's, I mean, that's where he goes. He, he ends up uh, moving forward that way. And so we see 
a David who is uh, completely, not completely changed, but he's a different, he's a better king for having gone through this. He's a better man for having gone through this. He now has an aspect, he has a wisdom that's been gained through a crucible of, of fire. Um, and I mean, that's the same for us. These times when we may be wallowing in regret or remorse that something happened, you can stay there stuck in the past, which is killing you and killing your future. Or you can say, you know, hey, uh, I, 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 by God's grace, I need to move forward and I can learn from this. And I can be a better servant of God moving forward with this hurt or this limp or this injury in my character or in my soul, I can move forward with a better view of ministering to others. And I really see that in David. I think we can see it in our own lives, but we have to move forward. You can't be held captive by regret. It kills the future. And so if you're sitting there saying, I'm dark hole, hey, um, it's, it may be time to say, I need to bring this to the cross. I need to truly be forgiven. Yes, I have, I have a part in this, but I don't need that guilt or that weight or that remorse uh, sitting on my shoulders. I take it to the cross, just like I take my own sins. I don't take my own sins and say, this is my dad's fault, uh, Jesus, and you fix him. It's like, this is me. I Yeah, I've inherited a sin nature. And this is how it comes. It comes out, manifests in me, but I bring me to the cross and ask your blood to cover me and build me into a new me. Not, my, not, not those who I got the problem from. We need to do the same thing then. As, you know, we can't be, I've said it enough times. Uh, we need to move forward in our lives. We need to come to a place where the grace of God is sufficient to cleanse me from all unrighteousness and that I can say I am a new creature or a new creation. And uh, the mercies of God are new every morning. And his love for me is an everlasting love. And nothing can separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. And every failure I have is an opportunity for me to be reshaped in wisdom, to be a peacemaker, a healer, a reconciler, a minister of grace. Would you pray with me? Father, I know each one of us has a different story and a different place where we are in our life right now. And but for some, that this may hit closer to home because there may be deep regrets based on the, the phase of life. For some, there may still be anger or animosity towards a parent or a loved one or someone who has in some way failed us. This is pretty universal, although for some it seems to be far more marked. Some are more flawed than that than others and have inherited uh, just a more obvious sinful character. And Lord, I pray that there could be healing there, but also wisdom to know that if someone cares, then that's a relationship to be healed and, and, and worked on. If someone doesn't care, maybe there's a bit of distance that needs to be placed there. Lord, we also pray going forward that we, if we're the person who's stuck in that area of regret or remorse, that uh, Lord, you'll help us to see, to be renewed in the in the washing of regeneration, Titus calls it, that uh, we, can, we can know the washing of the Holy Spirit. We know the freedom that's in Christ. And we move forward with wisdom, being a person who is just has a little more perspective on life and able to deal with situations with a, a seasoning of a little more grace in things, that we might be a healer, a peacemaker, a reconciler like our Lord Jesus Christ, who has reconciled us unto himself and unto the Father. And for that, we're so thankful in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you all and uh, have a great week. We will keep this going until we're allowed to meet again together. And then uh, we'll let you know when that is. God bless.